Uh, there's a question here, and this is uh, related to the question about the Trinity. So, how do you explain uh, Genesis 1.26? This is being used to support. Okay. All right, so that's a great question. So the question is that if, if Jews traditionally don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, how do you um, explain a passage like Genesis 1.26? And I'll explain what that passage is about. Uh, the first thing it should be stated is that the Trinity is not found in the Jewish Bible, as I mentioned to you. You won't find the formula of the Trinity anywhere in the Jewish Bible. You will find it in the Christian Bible in like 1 John uh, 5, 7, and 8, but there's a question over whether that's an, a, a passage that was original to the Epistle of John. Uh, but the question is Genesis 1.26. God is now about to create mankind, the purpose of all creation, the jewel of all of his manifestation. And we have this very strange text, and it says there, let us, let us create man in our image. And that leaves everyone with the huge question, who is he talking to? Let us, let us, who is he talking to? Now, there is a problem. Problem is, what's the problem? It doesn't say. It means the text is ambiguous. There's nothing there in the passage that tells us who God is addressing. And if you go to your library here at this university, you'll have Kyle and Delich. I'm sure you'll have it because this is a fine Christian university. You're going to have your Ryrie Study Bible. You're going to have Pink. You're going to have great commentators. You're going to have Spurgeon. You're going to have Calvin. And, you, and they're going to take this apart. Who is it talking and why is he using this kind of language? It's all there. But I'll explain to you what's really happening. Now, one of the things that you'll find that's very strange is when you go to the library here and you open up Kyle and Delich, on Gilead Delage is like 10 volumes. It's huge. It cost me like $500 25 years ago. And why am I angry? Do you know why I'm angry? <laughs> I'm angry because today I can download it for free on the internet. <laughs> this was written 100 years ago, so it's not copyright protected. I mean, I'm sure President Kara could relate to this. Years ago, when we were studying scripture as students, a long time ago, we didn't have CD, DVD. I actually had to buy all of Luther's works. It cost me a fortune. It was 55 volumes. All the works of the church fathers. I don't remember how many volumes it was. We actually had to have the book. There was no CD, DVD, internet. These things didn't exist. I had to have Kyle and Delich's commentary on the Jewish Bible. It's 10 or 11 volumes long. It cost a fortune, a fortune. Okay, so one of the very interesting things you're going to find when you go to your library here and look not at Jewish literature but at Christian commentators, you're going to see that many of them, and Kyle and Delich are going to do this, Ryrie, Charles Caldwell Ryrie, many of you know but may not. One of the strange things they're going to say is that, that it seems to point in the direction of this passage, God is addressing the angels. God is... Again, it just says, let us make man. Stop. It's completely ambiguous. So we don't have information. There's nothing about a trinity there, certainly. But we don't even know who God is speaking to. So what do we do? This is called hermeneutics. When we have a passage that's ambiguous, there's a principle, there's something that Jews and Christians do to figure out what is this passage referring to? What do we do? It's just a very basic rule of hermeneutics. And that is, well, Scripture interprets Scripture. We need another passage that what is called, the term we use is that is more graphic, more clear, that is more in the light, to help us understand this passage that's ambiguous, that's in the dark. Incidentally, you never want to use an ambiguous tag, t passage, one that's hard to understand, to reinterpret a passage that is clear in the light. That's how you get a cult. 
That's how you get in a lot of trouble. So you have a passage, that's, this is an ambiguous passage, we just don't know. What we want to do is you want to get another passage, same context, same language, that could supply the information necessary to know what this passage is talking about. Well, as it turns out, there are a lot of them. And what I want to do is I'll give you one passage for whoever asked the question, and there's just two chapters later in exactly the same context. It's talking about the creation of man, but after the sin, specifically in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Now what happens there, to give you the context, is that man has already eaten from the tree of knowledge. He cannot remain in the Garden of Eden. Why? There was a danger. There was something in the Garden of Eden that he could not eat from. And that was what? The tree of life. And he turns to the, oh, we're getting more information, the Keruvim. These are burning angels. And he says to them, you have to stand before the garden. They cannot come in here. They have to be expelled. Because if man now eats from the tree of life, he will become like one of us. Exactly. So what we find in Scripture is, whether it's this passage or 1 Kings 8 or Job is, we have a heavenly court. We find the same thing in Zechariah chapter 3. And when, when, when Scripture is using this language where God is addressing others about man, when in Zechariah 3, when Yehoshua, the son of Yehoshadok, is brought before God by Satan with dirty clothing on, in any one of these contexts, that's what would supply the information. But here we're really lucky because we have Genesis 3.22 right nearby. So in classical Jewish tradition, that passage is, of course, not speaking about a trinity. God is addressing the angels, and he's saying, let us make men like us. Now, why angels? Why angels? Why is he addressing his heavenly court? And he does this, God does this a lot. Because we have something in common with angels. See, we are a combination. We're both doggy, right? But we're also divine. Both. So dogs are like this. Cats are like this. The head and the tail are on the same level. Man only is like this. Divine air. Angels are only divine, meaning they're only of a divine nature. That doesn't mean they're God. Angels are messengers of God, but they don't have free will. They're not made out of the ground. They don't need to eat. They don't need these things. So therefore, God now comes together with the angels to create the centerpiece of his creation, that's mankind. That, that's, how, that's Genesis 1.26. And incidentally, it should be said and, and that not all, but I don't know if most, but a, a great number of some of the most highly respected Christian commentators will say exactly, if you go to the, you have in your library, I am sure, the New International Version Study Bible. I guarantee you it's in your library. It will say exactly what I've just told you in the commentary. The Christian scholars look at the same passage, not all but many, and draw the exact same conclusion. And the reason is not based on special, secret, mysterious knowledge, but on a basic rule of hermeneutics. As Genesis 126, we can understand what it means and who God is addressing because of the context. Not because of any sages and not because of any Christian commentators. Any one of us could have done this by simply looking at the context. בחייב צוקות אזי מלך אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא עובד והוא 
אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע וחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע וחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך 